I am now joined by some of the most brilliant artisans working in television today. Not only is their work crucial to shows like Star Trek Discovery and Star Trek Picard, but it is especially notable that they join us today on First Contact Day because their jobs often call for creating first contacts and exploring strange new worlds in this beloved franchise. So please welcome senior creature designer Neville Page, costume designer Gersha Phillips, makeup and prosthetics department head James McKinnon, and visual effects supervisor Jason Zimmerman. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for hopping on. It is such a treat to have you all together for this incredibly special panel. Well, to start us all off today, could you each briefly tell us what your first contact with Star Trek was? My first contact with Star Trek was in 1994, working on Deep Space Nine. That is one of the highlights of my career, just to be able to work in this franchise, work with Michael Westmore, which was the makeup designer back then for many, many years on all the Star Trek TV shows and movies, uh, just as a young makeup artist, just having a, that opportunity was amazing. My first contact was uh, with J.J. Abrams and his his first Star Trek film. We were working or just finishing on Cloverfield and uh, J.J. simply presented the opportunity to me, which of course one cannot pass up. Um, and it was really incredible to be there right at the beginning of J.J.'s Star Trek and to meet uh, this guy who had a laptop that was writing some words. I think his name was Kurtzman. Yes, that was him, Alex Kurtzman. <laughs> he was, he was uh, there as well. And um, that was my first contact with Alex as well, which um, I was always a fan of Star Trek, um, but I didn't know the world that well. And, and Alex was a great resource for Educated. So um, my first uh, contact with Star Trek was um, when I was a kid, actually, watching with my parents. I watched the original series. Um, I think they might, there probably were reruns, but um, watched the original series and I think um, the movies. First contact. My foray into Star Trek, I like Gersha, happened when I was a kid. I think my first memory is from uh, watching The Wrath of Khan. And specifically the scene where the eel goes into Chekhov's ear. Uh, I don't think I slept for about a month after that. It's very interesting. That is a lot of people's first memories, specifically because they were scarred for life by it. And now I, they I all were on Star Trek. I have a whole thing about ears now because of that movie. <laughs> I have a whole thing about Q-tips now because of that. <laughs> <laughs> that. That's the best thing about this. As a young makeup artist, when when watching that movie, I was looking at that prosthetic ear that's that Michael made and how the hair was punched and how the hair was laid on the sideburns and how that ear was colored. So those those moments, as well as for Jason, those scar me for life in a great way where I learned from that and learned how to make that kind of stuff for myself. Absolutely. And James, you worked on the Star Trek First Contact movie. So what is your history of working on the Star Trek franchise? And what do you remember about working on that movie specifically in honor of First Contact Day? It was probably one of the, at that time, one of the bigger movies that I have done. Um, again, like I said earlier, I had done Deep Space Nine and Voyager previous to that. And simultaneously, they were shooting Star Trek First Contact at the same time. So Paramount was very, very big with, with Star Trek at the moment. So we would all jump from the TV shows to the movies just to be able to do a Borg as a young artist, just to be able to do that was a great opportunity. Uh, Michael Westmore brought me in to help uh, apply a little prosthetic to Brent Spiner as data. Those, those kind of opportunities were amazing in my career and elevated me as an artist as well. And then be, to be able to work with Brent again. Brent is great. Don't tell him I said that though. Yeah. He doesn't need a big He already knows. He yeah. already knows. Yeah. <laughs> um, but speaking of first contacts, as I mentioned earlier, working on Picard and Discovery in particular, all of you have lots of opportunities to create many firsts as there are two of the most future set shows that are in canon currently. So Gersha, you most recently designed Starfleet uniforms for the 32nd century. Could you talk a little bit about the challenges and also probably the thrills that you get from blazing new trails in Star Trek? Yes, um, I think for me, uh... I mean, for the team and myself, we were, you know, the idea of coming up with a new uniform we were already, when we were already so pleased with what we had done on the disco uniforms um, was quite challenging. Because, you know, I think you, we were reaching such high grounds already for, for what we were doing for the 23rd century. So having to go further was, was you know, it was quite challenging and, and also quite daunting, actually, because it was like, OK, well, how do you better what we did already? And 
you know, make it better, more futuristic, sleeker, you know, all the things that we were trying to attain. With our Illustrator, we must have done about, you know, 20 or 30 different uniform options that we proposed and showed um, um, the team, Alex, Tunde, Michelle. And from that, we whittled it down to like about 10 of them. And then from there, we started um, prototyping and making things. One of the things that I was trying to do was to come up with an idea of, um, or a way of um, construction that was less visible. So you didn't see the seams as much. You didn't see the constructions, the construction lines, et cetera. It just had a more cleaner, more, um, you know, I keep the word I always want to use is futuristic look to it. So, um, you know, we, we used, we had started with some bonding ideas in the, when we did the first uniform. So we brought that into this uniform. So there, it's a, the fabric is a Euro jersey and it um, has this bonding um, sort of spacer fabric behind it that gives it that sort of lofty feel where it sits away from the body. In, in all, I think they're pretty, they turned out pretty good. It was, you know, we were really proud the first day we shot the scene on Federation HQ and um, Admiral Vance was dressed in his uniform and everybody looked so, so great. It was really an awesome moment. You know, designing for the 30, 32nd century is definitely um, something, you know, you don't think about what that looks like and what it's going to be like when you start this journey. And having to do it now, it's been um, it's been an interesting an interesting experience. And, and we've sort of captured something that definitely feels more futuristic and, and a little sleeker. And, and luckily for us, the sets and everything work really well with what we've done right now, especially the, the Federation HQ set. The um, the Discovery ship is a little more challenging because we end up finding out that our uniforms match the walls. So that was a little bit of an interesting journey. So oh, no. Call, <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, all in all, I think... Um, I'm, I think we're, I'm, I mean, I'm pretty happy with them. I don't know what the fans are saying yet because I haven't actually tapped into that, but hopefully they like what we did. I'm sure they love it. It's also so fascinating to hear the thought process that goes behind creating something that technically doesn't exist yet. You're not doing a period piece, you're doing a future piece for fantasy. But you guys all in the past have talked about how closely all of your departments work together. So Jason, could you explain a little bit about how visual effects, for example, collaborates with creature design or prosthetics and makeup or costumes? Sure. I mean, you know, at this point, this many years into discovery and everything, I think we all know each other pretty well. And, you know, fortunately mm -hmm. for me as a visual effects supervisor, these guys understand the challenges that I face in my department and, you know, vice versa. So, we, you know, we, whenever a script comes out, we all sort of communicate and check in just to see how things are going. I mean, obviously, if it's, uh, you know, like special effects makeup or whatever, and it's, you know, something that James and his team is doing, uh, you know, there's not really much that we have to do unless it's something that's scripted, if there's an antenna that needs to move or, or, or whatever. But, you know, as evidenced by the 600 Emmys he has behind him, uh, you know, we don't have to worry too much about <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to worry too much about that. And, and you know, working with Neville is great, too, because, you know, Nev understands visual effects, I think, as much as I do. Uh, so we'll touch base and we'll talk about, you know, he'll share designs and we'll talk about how we're going to execute it from a creative standpoint, sort of, you know, what the behavior of the creatures is going to be and all that. Uh, you know, again, by and large, it's, I'm very fortunate to have a team that everybody kind of understands sort of intuitively what, what each of us do. And we kind of work very complimentary in that way. Absolutely. And Neville, your job of designing creatures is almost like playing God in a way, especially when you're creating a new alien just completely from scratch. So how do you go about designing something that is completely different from anything we've seen before while still being honestly, properly true to Star Trek? It's such a difficult thing because there's no, there's no language or specific terminology that that's, that is what a Star Trek creature is. Much like with Gersha and doing the costumes, there, there's a language, but it's not written down that we can refer to. I guess that's where all of us involved in creating things for Star Trek are sort of by nature fans of the franchise by osmosis, by being surrounded by other artists. Um, you find yourself in this groove of the Star Trek language. And then there's the other division, if you will, which is Picard is slightly different in, in tone and look than Discovery, than Strange New Worlds. And yet they have to all be homogenous and cohesive. 
Well, I feel like that speaks to a certain incredibly heightened talent and skill that you guys as artisans have. It's all coming from not only your knowledge of the franchise itself, but just your your raw talent and ability to be incredibly creative. So I know that the fans and the franchise can't thank you enough for all of your contributions to what we see on the screen. And kind of on the same note, James, as we talked about, you've been working on Star Trek since the early days. And since the early days, makeup, visual effects, everything has grown. So how has makeup and prosthetics evolved since your time on First Contact to more recently, you know, on Picard? Yeah, I think um, in the past 15 years, probably that's about when our products have changed a lot. Uh, back in the, not the older days, but foam latex was our product of choice, which is lightweight, uh, but it is opaque. So you have to paint depth into it. Um, so as an artist, you have to learn how to, how to, you know, your skin has seven or eight colors on it. So you've got to paint that opaque, n opaqueness out of the foam latex. Uh, and now we're, we moved from gelatin and then now into silicone, um, which is now see-through and you can see through it. And when Neville designed something on the computer, we can go, oh, we can see that those veins underneath, underneath there. And I can paint that. It's just like. Uh, beauty cosmetics. Every day when we wake up, there's another cosmetic company or another cosmetic line. And it's the same in our business too. There's another glue, there's another product, there's another formulation that makes our work better for those 4K, 8K, 12K televisions now that everybody sees. So if I splatter these little colors too too big, the, the audience is going to be able to see that that's paint. So there's a fine tuning that I have to do on that end that I don't want Jason to have to fix later. Uh, and then as well as with Gersha, the, ama the um, amount of amazing costumes she makes, but she doesn't know how thick a prosthetic's gonna be around a neck. So we work together to make sure that she gets, she's gonna laugh on that one. I wanna make sure that she gets that prosthetic as soon as possible so she can have as much time as she needs to make that collar as big as possible. The through line of this awesome panel has really just been collaboration and working together. So Gersha, how do you take one of Neville or James's creations and design clothes for them when they, you know, need clothes, that is? And how do you incorporate and interpret a new alien's culture and what their fashion should look like in that moment in time? I mean, the the, the thing that I, we do have as sort of a Bible is the script, you know, so mm, right. depending on how the script's described, the alien, that helps. And then obviously um, working with Neville's creature that, that they're given to me, I usually take cues from that as well. So yeah, it's like, you know, the combination of those things is how we come up with it. So whether they're going to, you know, whether we're going to mold something and add more molded bits to what we're doing, you know, to create it, to make it look more alien, um, rather than just, you know, putting on cloth on them, you know, there's a, you know, there's a lot of different ways of approaching it. And it really does boil down to where they inhabit what they're what where are they coming where they're coming from you know the place that they inhabit and how we're going to approach what they have to do etc in the scene you know it's an interesting thing hearing you say that your show about aliens and th there's an assumption that when an alien is designed uh, we are thinking of their culture and we do um and that culture that i may be thinking of has to align perfectly with what gersha is thinking of and although everything is about collaboration and I'm going to puncture it by saying communication. If I was designing the human race, I would come up with the shapes and, and deal with it as a nude for the most part. And then that would go to Gersha. And Gersha, based on the Bible, the script, would come up with the appropriate culture uh, that is appropriate for where that human resides on this planet Earth, for example. So there are times when I um, and others don't have to concern themselves with all those extremely important nuances, because when you're left with a head and hands, there may not be an earring um, or a ring or a watch that communicates culture and, and, and science and all that. That's all Gersha, which that's a huge and wonderful thing that I, I love and respect about costume designers. That's where you get to go really deep into character development. Just as we've discussed the evolution of makeup and prosthetics and costuming, we're also experiencing an evolution of visual effects and technology, kind of like Star Trek. So Jason, you are getting to work with a fancy new augmented reality wall on Discovery Season 4, which is a first contact for you behind the scenes. So first of all, can you explain 
what that is to people who may not know and how it's factored into your VFX workflow. Sure, definitely. Um, I think I think it's a first contact, not just for us in VFX, but production in general, at least for us, you know, learning this new technology. And what it is, is it's a 270 degree uh, stage made up of LED panels that display an image. Um, and that image can be whatever we want. So if you, uh, it's, 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 it leverages game engine technology. Uh, it uh, has cameras and sensors, which basically allow us to put fully immersive 3D environments um, on this stage so that it, it appears as if our actors or our action is taking place in a faraway place. It, it's, it's really, really helpful, I think, in that rather than shooting something on a blue screen where you put it in later, it allows for the actors to see what they're actually, where they are, you know, they see what planet they're at. Um, the lighting for the DPs allows the light to actually bounce off of the actors. So it, it, the integration of it and the, and the way that it looks, you know, filmically is really good because you're actually shooting it through real lenses at the time. Everybody on this call will know that if, if we have this AR environment, there may be something that affects the way that it, the, the light bounces off of the makeup or a costume or any of those things or for the art department, what the floor you know, may do reflectively with the surface. And so it, it, it really requires even more departmental communication because everybody needs to sort of work within this space that's entirely virtual up until, you know, probably the time that you get to test and shoot it. And so that's sort of a new paradigm for everybody, you know. Well, you know, in, in respects to AR, the, the paradigm shift of being front end savvy is really what it's all about is you're planning and scheduling totally differently and having to make those decisions at the beginning versus in post. So that is simply a paradigm shift in how we all work. And so you, you have to be respectful of the other departments and the technology so that you are designing towards an end result that is manageable. It's e for me, my job is easy as a designer. I could make things so complex with just the, the stroke of a brush and a pain in the butt for <laughs> um, James when it's like, okay, now how do we sculpt that practically now? Well, thank you so much. Right. <laughs> we, James, we talked about I have an idea, James, you have an idea. Let's see how those can work together. So when the collaboration goes from me to you, you're, you're doing your, you have something that you can do your best with. Yeah, it depends on what, what color on, in your computer, can I achieve that color actually on the skin or make it look shiny or see-through? Yeah, it's definitely a conversation we have to go back and forth because I do have a, only a color realm that I can grab from or create from and I'm also sure on behalf of cosplayers everywhere, they also thank you for practicality so they don't have to go and mix some color that doesn't exist yeah. for a yeah. convention. And it's, and it's expensive. It's expensive stuff. And the cosplayers, they go through a lot of it. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by what they can recreate. As a cosplayer, my bank account is very sad, so I understand. You guys are innovative. I, I, I keep an eye on cosplay more now than ever because I'm learning things. That's your pool of designers, Gersha, to start hiring for. Oh, we do, we do, we do, actually. <laughs> Gersha, you actually may hold the record for designing more uniforms than almost anyone in Star Trek, which, round of applause, that is incredible. We know inspiration can come from pretty much anywhere, but what are some of your personal design inspirations that help you keep things fresh? Because these uniforms are always looking fresh. Thank you, thank you. Um, I mean, for me, I sort of get inspiration from everywhere. I feel like I'm a sponge. I, you know, if I'm walking down the street, I might see something that inspires me. Um, or, you know, a picture in a magazine. There's designers that I really love. Um, I always talk about Iris Van Herpen, um, Alexander McQueen, Stella McCartney. Um, now Magella is doing really cool things. You know, there's so many of them. Gareth Pugh that um, I've been inspired by. And also my team, I have to say. I have a really great team and they'll either bring me things and their ideas sometimes are really helpful. You know what I mean? So, you know, like I say, it comes from anywhere. I might go, like I always say, I go to bed with a problem and I wake up with an answer. And somewhere during that night, there's, you know, something comes up that I'm like, oh, this is what I'm going to do. And that makes it work. I love that. Well, you said there's a McQueen inspiration. When can we see a Chanel suit? <laughs> on the bridge of the Star Trek, come on. I have to say, we were doing this Andorian the other day and I was like, this feels like Andorian Chanel. <laughs> yes, that's all we need, that's all we want. <laughs> Hopefully it'll, it'll get coverage. All of you guys have helped usher in this beautiful new golden age of Star Trek. And you're talking about, you know, your creations and things that you've done. Um, I kind of want to know, James, what is your favorite piece that you've created that you're particularly proud of? This can be from any of the new Star Trek shows you've worked on. 
or old ones? I can't. Uh, I, 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 this is an answer I never will say I have a favorite one. Everything I do is my favorite because everything is new and exciting and different each time. Uh, so we are creating something from scratch. So that moment is is my best. And I don't ever want to be the best because then I never can grow as an artist. I mean, obviously recreating Borgs with Neville is awesome. Uh, that new technology, that new look, that new product that I get to use uh, mm -hmm. to recreate it. It's a very diplomatic answer, but I do love it. It was a very uplifting answer as well. Jason, what has it been like for you going from the first season of Discovery to now in 2021, where you have helped establish so much of what makes these, what, five or more ongoing series tick? Uh, it's overwhelming to, to, mm -hmm. to be a part of the franchise. And, you know, when I, when I came on at the beginning of Discovery, I really only had that in my, in, in my sights at that point. So to be a part of multiple shows and, and working on all these iconic characters and creatures and, and, you know, starships and everything. I mean, it, it's a, it's a daunting franchise with an incredible legacy and to be able to play with things like the enterprise or, you know, Picard and data, those are things that, you know, as a visual effects artist and as a fan of, Star Trek and film that that's just it's it's so exciting to be a part of that so it's it's very humbling I think I'm probably the luckiest guy in visual effects to be able to have this job so oh this is such a heartwarming panel you guys I'm getting all the warm fuzzies I love hearing you guys talk about your passions um and speaking of passions Neville you're a man of many hats and many talents so what is your favorite part of your job your job is so overarching but what is the thing that you love to do the most um well, I think my favorite thing is when I'm uh, posed with a challenge that I don't have an answer to. You know, sometimes we're, we're asked to design a thing and you go, oh, okay, I think I know what to do. And that's uh, sometimes a relief. But I really enjoy mostly when I hear a, a pitch that almost makes no sense. Uh, and, and, and we get a lot of that in Star Trek because the, the writers have some crazy ideas, wonderfully crazy ideas. Um, and it is our job, all of us in this presentation today, to come up with the answer for those ideas. And it's a dead thing. It's an idea until Gersh addresses it, uh, James applies it to someone, sculpts it, and makes it a real thing. The performer brings it to life, and Jay-Z um, and his crew does their magic to animate it, which is a hugely involved process of rigging and weighting and textures and lighting and all these amazing things. I, I create the inert. It's, it's nothing until these guys really infuse it with life. And that honestly is the greatest thrill for me is to see something that was just an idea brought to life by these incredible artists. I love hearing everybody talk about what they love to do and how much they love to do it, how much you guys love Star Trek and working on Star Trek. So for the viewers at home that may be interested in their own first contact with all of your professions, I know as a kid, before I got into acting, I wanted to be a costume designer. I My mother is a makeup artist, so I was like, maybe I'll go into makeup and not follow my father's footsteps and you know, just, what, what, what would you guys tell them? These, these people at home who go, I wanna be a visual effects designer. I, I wanna create monsters. I wanna dress them up and I wanna paint that on somebody's face. What would you tell them? I mean, it's just getting into it and getting started. Um, I volunteered first. That's how I started my journey in this business. So, um, I volunteered at the Canadian Film Center um, and uh, did a, a whole feature, a six week, uh, a six week feature for free. And, uh, but it was a great experience. I learned so much. And, um, you know, I think that that was the beginning of my journey. hundred percent. I mean, I, I think for me, I, I, I would, I mean, there's a lot of technical things to visual effects and sure that stuff factors in, but learn the fundamentals of art and design and photography and composition and all the, the, the things that go back to paintings from 500 years ago, that stuff is every bit as relevant right now in what we do as it was then. And so I think learning that stuff and then to their points, in turn, try a bunch of different things. If you want visual effects, try that, try other things, learn how all the departments work, really get, you know, get involved and, and just see how a production is made because you'll learn a lot that way and you can get a lot from it. Yeah, I, I hire, I hire uh, makeup students from makeup schools wherever I'm at. I grab some people when I was in Toronto and I have, uh, PAs that are from MUD out here. So uh, give it, giving an opportunity and giving back after doing this 31 years, I'm, I'm giving back to my community to people that are going to replace me eventually. So my knowledge 
for them to learn my knowledge. I don't want to hide it and, and take it all myself. I want to give it back to people. So when, when they start in this business and when they become wherever I'm at in my career, they can now do that back to the other people. I say in short, be patient with yourself um, and to be long with the answer. That means um, I'm not a big fan of saying to students, um, I've taught for about 20 years, and I don't say to people, if you just believe in yourself, then you can do it. You've got to know what it is you're capable of and know your limitations and be honest with yourself. So if, to James, his point, um, if you have a passion, pursue it, A, get the education with what um, Jay-Z was saying, really learn all the stuff, not just the cool contemporary artists that got you interested in being in the industry. The old stuff is very relevant. And, and then check yourself every now and then, gauge where you're at. But the key is to be patient because you could be terribly in your own um, est estimation, assessment of yourself. You could be really bad now, but there could be that moment if you're just patient enough, where it could be the tipping point to start to the lights go off and you get it. That is the hardest thing for artists. How many of us either do it or have seen it where you crumple up the piece of paper, that's not it, and you just want to give up. I to, to this day, I still feel that way. I will start a design on Star Trek and I will question myself, should I be doing this? I really am terrible at this today. And then I'll be patient with myself. And I can mean, still be terrible the next day. But the key thing is to just kind of relax into it, be patient, knowing that you can you can overcome your insecurities uh, at some point. And with the skills and with the passion combined, that's the thing that gets you over the hurdle. That is the perfect note to end on. So thank you guys so much for joining me. I feel like we've really only just scratched the surface of your incredible contributions to Star Trek. I seriously personally wish we had more time, but I'm sure we will all meet again very soon once new seasons have started. Speaking of which, you at home can go back and watch all of these people's amazing work on Star Trek Discovery and Star Trek Picard, which are both now streaming on Paramount+. And remember, Today, on First Contact Day, we are reviving our Star Trek United campaign where you can pitch in and support. For every person who tweets the hashtag Star Trek United Gives, Paramount Plus will donate $1 to organizations who do the real world work of championing equality, social justice, and the pursuit of scientific advancements. Neville, Gersha, James, and Jason, thank you so much again and happy First Contact Day. Thank you. Happy First Contact Day. Happy thank First you. Contact Day. <laughs>